Welcome back to The Deep Dive, where we take a stack of your source material, strip away the dense jargon, and deliver the specific knowledge you need to be well-informed fast. And today, we are looking at what a lot of people in the maker community are calling, well, the single biggest hardware evolution in the history of the Arduino platform. Yeah, that is not an overstatement. We are diving into the brand new and very highly anticipated Arduino Uno Q. It's a big deal. I mean, for years, Arduino just meant a straightforward microcontroller. But the fundamental shift here, the real aha moment, is that the Uno Q is uh, both. Both. It's a powerful microcomputer and a microcontroller, and they're living together on one standard size board that's completely new. So it's a true hybrid device. Wow. And the source material makes it pretty clear this is a direct result of a major corporate move. The Q and Uno Q, that stands for Qualcomm. Right, and this is the first product released since Arduino's acquisition. That partnership really explains the just the immediate leap in processing power and architecture we're seeing. Mm -hmm. It's moving Arduino into a completely different league. So for this deep dive, we're going to give you the shortcut to understanding this beast. We'll unpack that uh, revolutionary dual processor architecture. And we'll explore the unique new development workflow. It's called App Lab where the old simplicity of sketches gives way to the power of apps and bricks. And finally, we'll cover the essential steps you need to get this hybrid board configured and running in its various modes. Let's do it. Okay, let's unpack the hardware. When we say hybrid, we don't just mean one chip doing twice the work. We're talking about two completely distinct brains. Right. Right. Operating independently. That's the key. It's two processors, two operating systems, and two programming environments, all designed to talk to each other seamlessly. So the power is separated. Exactly, separated across two different disciplines. You have raw computing on one side and real-time control on the other. Let's start with the computing powerhouse then. What's running the microcomputer side, the MPU? That's handled by the Qualcomm QRB2210 chip. And this is a, a really serious piece of silicon. It's an ARM Cortex A53 processor running at Two gigahertz. Two gigahertz, wow. And the source has really emphasized its multimedia capabilities too. It includes an Arduino 702 GPU, a graphics processing unit. A GPU. And two internal image processors. A GPU and dedicated image processors. I mean, that tells me right away they expect users to be doing, you know, real-time computer vision, heavy media stuff right out of the box. Mm -hmm. And the whole microcomputer environment, it runs a full-fledged Debian Linux operating system. That is a massive shift. You're not just uploading a small program anymore. You're basically managing a desktop environment and complex processes. Right. And naturally, the programming language for this side is Python. And for memory. It ships with two gigabytes of LP DDDR4 RAM. There is a four gigabyte model that's anticipated for a future release, but for now, it's two. So running Debian Linux at 2 GHz, that puts the Uno Q directly in competition with small single board computers like a Raspberry Pi. It does, but with that classic Arduino DNA still attached. Right. That's the crucial difference. Exactly. The MPU, it handles the networking, heavy math, the complex logic, the OS. But what handles the physical pins and the precise, you know, real-time input and output? That's the job of the second brain. The traditional Arduino side, the microcontroller, or MCU. And that MCU is the ST Microelectronics STM32U585 chip. It's based on an ARM Cortex M33 processor running at a much lower but hyper-focused 130 megahertz. And the memory on that side. It has two megabytes of flash memory and 786 kilobytes of static RAM. And importantly, this side runs on the Zephyr real-time operating system. The RTOS. The RTOS, yes. And a real-time operating system is critical here because it ensures tasks execute exactly when they're supposed to, without any delays or buffering from Linux. And that side is still programmed in C++ lib. Okay, so that is the perfect handshake. It really is. You use the brute force of Python and Linux for the intelligence and the networking, and then the precision of C++ and the RTOS for like motor control, sensor readings, exact timing. So before we get into how those two brains talk, let's look at the physical board itself. All right. I see it keeps the classic size and form factor. Yes. It keeps the standard 68.6 .6 by 53.4 millimeter dimensions, and the familiar I.O. connectors and mounting holes. You can still use the same cases, the same enclosures as the Uno R3 or R4 Wi-Fi. Okay, but here's a vital warning from the source material. Mm -hmm. Older Unos, they used 5V logic. This board is fundamentally 3.3V. Does that mean all our old shields are suddenly useless? No, not entirely. And this was a really smart move by the designers. They made the board mostly 5V tolerant. Well, that's excellent news. It is. It means you can reuse the vast majority of your older 5V components and shields. But? But 
There is a glaring and uh, potentially dangerous exception. Which is? The critical thing to memorize is that pins A0 and A1, the first two analog input pins, they are not 5V tolerant. Okay, so if you connect a 5V signal to those specific pins. You risk damaging the STM32U585 MCU chip. It's a small detail, but I mean, it's one that could absolutely brick your board if you forget it. That is a high stakes detail to remember. What about new features we haven't seen on UNO before? Well, we have built-in Wi-Fi 5, and it supports both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz channels. It also has Bluetooth 5.1 and Bluetooth low energy. Okay, and physically on the board? Physically, it includes a dedicated boot pin, which you'll need for firmware updates. And it also features a multicolor LED matrix display, which is similar to the one on the R4 Wi-Fi. Just to quickly clarify that term, a multicolor LED matrix display. Is that what the sources are calling the Charlie Plex display? Correct. It's a technique Charlie Plexing that lets you control a high number of individual LEDs using a much smaller number of microcontroller pins. It's very efficient. Right. It simplifies the wiring and gives you that built-in visual feedback right out of the box. Exactly. Now let's flip the board over. The sources mentioned some specialized high-speed ports. Yes. On the back, you'll find two high-speed connectors that are totally unique to the Uno Q. There's JMISC, which handles audio and specific power rails, and the J Media connector, which is designed for two cameras and display control. And that one runs on 1.8V logic. So these aren't just standard I.O. pins, they are specialized lanes for high bandwidth data, mm -hmm. which I guess explains why the MPU has that dedicated GPU and those two image processors. It's proof. It shows this board was built from the ground up for advanced media applications. But there's a catch, right? There is. The caveat is that the official expansion cards for these high-speed interfaces, they aren't currently available. They are promised, though. So it future-proofs the hardware, but for now, we're sort of waiting to unlock that full potential. That's right. Okay, here's where it gets really interesting for me. How do you program a dual-brain board? I mean, especially if you have to manage two separate projects, Python on one side, C++ on the other, we leave sketches behind and enter the world of apps. Well, the old way would have been a nightmare. You'd use the traditional Arduino IDE for your C++ code, and then, you know, a separate editor for your Python. And then you'd have to manually write all the code to get them talking to each other. Exactly. All the complex inter-process communication, you'd be trying to debug two separate projects at the same time. That sounds incredibly complicated for a typical maker. Is this new App Lab environment really seamless, or are we going to see constant synchronization headaches? The App Lab, and it's an installable development environment unique to the Uno Qits, designed specifically to manage this complexity. It solves that synchronization problem by just unifying the project definition. So what exactly is an app in this context? An app is a single unified project folder. It contains everything. The Python code, the sketch, which is the C++ code, any necessary assets. And the magic part. And most importantly, the bridge software that automatically handles the communication between the two systems you manage one project, not two. That immediately simplifies everything. And within this new structure, we have a completely new concept, bricks. What are they and why do we need them? Bricks are um, reusable, standardized code building blocks. You can think of them as prepackaged functionality. So they may contain really complex logic. Right, like communicating with an external API or running machine learning models, but they're designed with super simple inputs and outputs. You just import them into your main Python code. So bricks aren't just simplified code snippets. They're standardized, tested, and prepackaged functions. So yeah. I don't have to worry about maintaining complex external libraries or you know dealing with API changes myself. Exactly. Arduino is doing that work for you. The source material uses the example of a weather forecast brick. Okay. So instead of writing a dozen lines of code to connect to a weather service and parse all the data, you just import the brick, pass it a city name, and boom! you get your forecast data back. It just abstracts away all the complexity. It does. It lets the user focus on their application logic. That is a huge value proposition for complex projects. So let's talk about the communication mechanics. If I want Python side to command the C++ side to, say, activate a motor, how does that bridge actually work in the code? It follows a really clean command and control separation. We can use the classic link example. On the Python side, the MPU side, you make what's called a bridge call. Which is basically saying, hey, MCU, do this thing. Precisely. For example, bridge.call set LED state, 
and then you pass the variable for the state you want on or off. And the C++ side, the MCU, has to be actively listening for that specific command. Exactly. The C++ code uses a bridge provide function, like bridge.provide set LED state. This function is set up to receive the instruction and the variable from the MPU. And then it executes the local C++ function to physically toggle the pin. That's it. The MPU handles the decision, the MCU handles the immediate real-time action. And here is that surprising technical detail to keep you on your toes. The sources note that unlike previous UNOs, the LEDs on the UNO Q are activated with a low signal. It's backwards. It is. It's an essential nuance for troubleshooting your very first Blink app. I mean, if you use the standard HIGH to turn it on, you'll be scratching your head wondering why nothing is happening. Okay, for the listener who is ready to order this board and just jump right in, let's cover the practical setup process. What software do I need before I even connect the USB cable? You need two key pieces of software downloaded. First is the Arduino App Lab, which is the main IDE you'll install. And second? The Arduino Flasher CLI. That's the command line interface utility. It usually comes as a zipped file you need to extract. Now, the very first step is crucial, and it involves physically touching the board, right? We have to flash the Linux image. Correct. The board has to be put into bootloader mode to receive that large Linux image. You do this by physically placing a jumper on the JCTL connector, specifically the USB boot jumper. So jumper in place, then you connect the USB-C cable. Exactly. And then you run the Flasher CLI program to download and flash that latest Linux image. Okay, and that's just a command line. Yes, the Arduino Flasher CLI flash command. This process is absolutely critical, and because those initial Linux images can be really large, the sources warn us this can take significant time. How much time are we talking? One example cited a large initial update taking 11 minutes. 11 minutes. That's long enough to start doubting your life choices. Oh. So patience is definitely requirement number one for setting up the Uno Q. What happens after the flash is successful? You must immediately disconnect the board, and this is crucial, remove that jumper. Right. If you forget to remove the jumper, it won't boot correctly. It won't. So once the jumper is off, you can connect the board again and launch the App Lab program. Now the board is connected and it's booting Linux for the first time. What's the configuration like inside App Lab? The App Lab guides you through the initial setup. It's basically configuring the Linux side of things. You have to name the board, set up the Wi-Fi connection with your password, install any final App Lab specific software updates, and finally, set the Linux credentials. I remember reading one of those credentials is fixed. It is. For security and standardization, the username for the Linux partition is fixed as Arduino. You just need to set a secure password. And once that's complete, the two brains are talking, App Lab is running, and you are ready to start writing your first app. Let's wrap up with the different ways you can actually use and interface with the Uno Q, because this dual brain architecture enables three distinct modes. Right. The simplest is PC mode. That's a direct connection via a USB-C cable to your computer. Just uh, make sure that cable is rated for data transfer, not just chirping power. Okay, simple enough. The second mode turns it into a self-contained desktop unit. That's single board computer mode or SBC mode. This is where the power of the MPU really shines. It lets you connect a monitor, a keyboard, a mouse, and interact with the full Linux desktop. But this mode has some very specific hardware requirements. It's not just plug and play absolutely essential. You must use a USB-C hub that includes a USB PD or power delivery input, and you need an external power supply rated for three amps or better. And why is that so critical? The board just needs consistent high wattage power to run Linux, the hub, and all those peripherals at the same time. And the sources gave a very specific product warning for this mode, didn't they? They did. Arduino explicitly warned that the Apple USB-C dongle is incompatible for setting up SVC mode. So you have to avoid that specific piece of hardware. Good to know. And while the Linux desktop is fully accessible in this mode, if you are using the two gigabyte RAM model, performance can sometimes be a bit sluggish. And finally, the truly wireless option. That's network mode. The board is connected only to a USB-C power supply, so no tether to your computer. And the host computer running App Lab connects remotely. Exactly, over your local Wi-Fi network. This is the ideal deployment scenario, but it requires that the board has already been through the full configuration with the network details and Linux credentials all set up. That brings us to the end of our deep dive. So to quickly summarize, the core interruption here is this fundamental shift from a simple MCU board to a powerful hybrid running C++ and Python. 
Right. And it's all unified and managed by the App Lab and this concept of reusable bricks. The whole system is really built to streamline the creation of complex real-world applications that need both heavy processing and precise real-time control. Mm -hmm. And if we connect this to the bigger picture, it's clear that while the UNOQ is functional now, I mean, it's capable of networking, running a Linux desktop, controlling hardware, the source materials repeatedly hint at its future potential. You mean those unique high-speed JMedia and JMIS connectors on the back, the ones that are currently dormant? Exactly. This board includes a GPU and two dedicated internal image processors. Those components aren't there for simple motor control. They are specialized for high bandwidth media processing and complex algorithms. And while the expansion cards for those interfaces aren't available yet? They are promised. So, here's the provocative thought for you to chew on. The applications we've seen so far, while they're impressive, they're only scratching the surface. What revolutionary systems involving computer vision, real-time machine learning inference, and high-speed data acquisition? What will truly be unlocked once those specialized high bandwidth expansion cards finally hit the market. That's the real potential of the Arduino Uno Q, and that is something worth closely watching out for.